Hi, welcome to My Favorite Mistake. I'm Mark Graven. We're joined today. Our guest is Scott O'Neill. He is the CEO of Harris Blitzer Sports and Entertainment. They're a global sports and entertainment company. If you don't know that name, you certainly know some of their iconic and innovative teams and brands. That includes the Philadelphia 76ers from the NBA and the New Jersey Devils from the NHL. So Scott has more than 20 years of experience working in professional sports, the NBA, NHL, and NFL. He's worked in the NBA league office, and he was formerly president of Madison Square Garden Sports. Um, Scott is the author of a book that's coming out in June called Be Where Your Feet Are, Seven Principles to Keep You Present, Grounded, and Thriving. So we'll talk about that today. Um, Scott, how are you? Thanks for joining us. You know, Mark, thank you. First off, I want to say thank you to you. Your, your podcast is fantastic. I think it's making a difference. And for those of us uh, who have made millions upon millions of mistakes, um, it's kind of heartwarming to see other people have gone through the fire as well. Well, thank you for that, Scott, and thank you for coming and, and sharing uh, a story today. Um, for those who aren't watching uh, on YouTube, if you're just listening, you won't see uh, the New Jersey Devils jerseys, uh, sweaters, I think. is do they still call them sweaters in hockey? They do. Is that just we do. And these, <laughs> these are all our retired. So we have Scott Stevens, Scott Niedemeyer, Ken Danico, Marty Brodeur, and Patrick Elias. So, so these are five of the all-time greats in the game of hockey, let alone the Devils. They certainly are. And they had, uh, there were, there were some good matchups with my Detroit Red Wings. I remember back yes. in the nineties. I heard you mention the stars before too. Have you, have you adopted the stars? Uh, a little a bit, team? a little bit since Dallas has been uh, home for a while, but I am uh, one of the many people who goes to the games wearing a Red Wings sweater in Dallas. <laughs> There's so many transplants. That's a unique challenge for that team. It is. Yeah. It's a transient city. And definitely hard. Yeah, this is more hardcore. Northeast, as you know, is just hardcore, hardcore sports fans. So uh, we got a, we got a game tonight and um, just going through COVID. It's been a blessing just to be in front of fans and go back to whatever the pseudo new normal is going to be. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I'm happy. I'm positive, And the life is good. Yeah, well, good. It's been a year of uh, so many changes um, in, in the sports world and um, adaptation. So um, thank you for being able to take some time here with all that going on um, to do the episode today. So, you know, as we normally do, we like to jump right in. I mean, Scott, looking back at all the things you've done, what would you consider to be your favorite mistake? It's a, it's a it's a wonderful question and something that I've been thinking a lot about since we uh, agreed to do this podcast. And um, and unfortunately, I had countless, countless things to, to draw from. And, and it was really interesting as I as I as I thought back to when I was a 22 year old and I remember um, listening to a speaker tell this big audience of which I was a part that every great leader fails, every great leader gets fired, every great leader drags the company to, to the ground every great. And I kept hearing, I kept saying, yeah, not me. I'm going to do it and I'm going to do it right. I'm going to stay on that path and I'm going to climb that ladder and things are going to go smoothly. And you know what? I actually did take a company into the ground and I have been fired and I've made so many mistakes along the way um, and have found that to be like a core principle of how we run our business. Like uh, it has to be okay to fail. You have to fail forward and fail up. And because that, you know, um, I think that expression is um, rough seas make the best sailors. And, uh, and I truly believe that you have this incredible opportunity to learn from all these mistakes. And I, I know that's the essence. I don't know. I'm assuming that's the essence of what you do and why you do it. Um, but, but my favorite mistake uh, harkens back to my days at the NBA, the NBA league office. And I, I was a, a young um, and not so up and coming executive at the time. You know, and, and kind of fighting my way through a big company. I'd never worked at a big company before. It had over a thousand employees. I'd just come from Hoops TV, which I'd run into the ground, which had 50 employees. And, uh, and I loved sm the small company vibe where you could get in a room with four people and make any decision in the world. And I, I found myself kind of running into wall after wall after wall. I had a really, really difficult onboarding experience where I went three months without a computer, a phone, business cards or any uh, expense check cut back. And as a young guy who was traveling five days a week, that was not ideal. Um, and so I was getting increasingly frustrated. Um, I, was, I was working harder than I'd ever worked before, um, thinking that I was doing everything right and everything was, was, was rolling around, rolling along smoothly. 
Um, I raised my hand to go uh, help out with the WNBA, um, which people were, you know, in, in, in a big company, they're like, why are you don't jump on a sinking ship ever in a big company? Um, and I, I, you know, I have three daughters. I love the game of basketball. I love women's basketball. I coach girls basketball. And um, so I sat in my first meeting and they had this big plan. Val Ackerman was the president at the time, who's still a dear friend today. And the plan was we need to reach teenage girls. Like that's going to transform this business. And I, I raised my hand first meeting still wet behind the ears. You know, I have an idea. And uh, as I had several um, stairs staring me down saying, who is the new guy and why is he raising his hand? I said, Hey, you know, I, I have a, a friend of mine who manages in sync at the time. It was a big boy band uh, run by Justin Timberlake and the manager's a friend and he'll do just about anything. You know, I think he owes me a favor. Let's like reach out to him. And so there was like muted enthusiasm. I kept saying like, Hey, you know, this is like the biggest band in the world right now. Like every teeny bopper girl, if you want to attract teenage girls, this is the way to do it. And they ended up giving us videos from the band members, autograph stuff. They dropped their new album at our game in 15 cities. I mean, it was incredible. Um, and then we set up co-promotions with all the iHeart radio stations and all the WNBA markets. Like if you were to design a program like from scratch with no restrictions and no limitations to lift a band, this is the one you would have done. And it failed miserably. So I, of course, being young and knowing everything in the entire world and never would it ever come down to me, started to point fingers. Like these guys don't get it. Like they don't, they don't, they don't do it. They don't make it happen. Like no wonder this league is struggling. Of course it's a young league. It will always be a young league because it was everybody else. And so I, I just coincidentally, two days later, after this flop and failure, got a call from Jeff Robinson, who was running human resources at the time at the NBA. And he was, this, he was calling to, to meet to do a six-month check-in, which is great for you know, a young executive. You know, so I, I went in his office, and he said, well, how, how's it going? And I said, candidly? He said, yeah, of course. I said, it sucks. This place sucks. He said, whoa. What, what, what's going on? And I said, well, here's the thing, Jeff. Like, and I went through my onboarding issues. You know, I'm still sitting at the intern desk. Still hadn't had $30,000 of credit card bills I couldn't pay because I hadn't got my, my money back. And now we tee up the best promotion that I ever possibly could hear of, and it failed. And he looked at me and, and he said, Scott, what, what role did you play in its demise? And I was like, me? Are you kidding me? I teed up, inside, I teed up the biggest boy band in the, in the world right now. He said, huh, but what, what role do you think you played? And um, after some frustrated back and forth, um, he said, well, how often are you on the road? And I, said, I proudly said every day. He said every day, like seven days a week. I said, no, 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 usually five or six days. Depends on if they're weekend games. He said, so you're, you're on the road five or six days. How often are you here? And I said, as little as possible. And he said, well, you know, this is a matrix organization, Scott, right? Do you, do you understand that? And I said, no, I don't know what a matrix organization is. He said, well, it just means that we work together in different ways. And so to be effective here, you're going to have to know somebody in each of those boxes to move anything forward. So do, do you know the folks in marketing? And I said, uh, no, no, I don't. How, how about digital media? No. How about the broadcast group? The, the ones that were working with the radio stations group you set up? It's like, no. Nope. Operations people? Mm -mm. How about the NBA entertainment crew? Uh, not really, no. Oh, really? Well, how about the, the, w, the WNBA? I said, well, I was in a meeting with them. He said, do you, do you know all their names? No, nah, no, nah, I don't. I, I, actually, I have no idea. I know Val. And, uh, and his lesson was, was pretty powerful. Um, you know, his, his message was really clear. Is that to me, he said, well, I, and he said, he's like, you need relationships. You need time on the ground. People need to know you and like you and they will help you. And I said, well, how do you do that? And he says, Scott, you're, you're, you're a sales, salesperson. That's a background, right? I said, yeah. He's like, I bet you can figure that part out. And, um, and so I started coming off the road more. And I always said, like, hey, that's where I add value. I'm a, I was a consultant in a group called Teambo. So we were effectively, like, changing the very nature of the way leagues and teams work together. 
And so I was a glorified consultant. So I would go and build best practices from team to team to team. And I thought like, if I wasn't out of the team, finding a best practice to bring to the next team, I wasn't doing my job, but I was missing the big picture. And so for me, what I did uh, coming out of there was I, I came off the road two days a week. I spent one day in our Secaucus, New Jersey office, all the entertainment folks. I, by the way, I didn't even know we had a Secaucus <laughs> office at the time. Yeah. And then I spent the other day uh, in our Manhattan office. And I spent it walking around and grabbing a Coke and having a lunch or just popping in to say hello. And I, and I will say like those relationships, that conversation with Jeff transformed the trajectory of my experience at the NBA because I wouldn't have stayed. They probably wouldn't have wanted me to stay and I wouldn't stay. And I ended up staying for almost eight years. And, and, then, and then those relationships I had catapulted me to not only tremendous friendships that I'll have forever. And there's some of my dearest friends in the world, but also when my boss left Bernie Mullen to go run the Hawks and the Thrashers, Commissioner David Stern, who was my boss at the time, said, like, there's only one person that can run this group. And it was me. And it wasn't because I was ready. It was because I had all these relationships. So everyone he talked to was like, hey, Scott, oh, you need to talk to Scott. Oh, Scott's incredible. He's in here yesterday. And so so that that one small mistake of kind of being myopic in my process, um, not seeing the big picture thinking that you can work, 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 work through any situation and not understanding kind of the dynamic of the way the world really works, which is through people and relationships. I mean, it, it sounds like um, to use a sports analogy, there was a lesson there around teamwork that you, Scott, might have been playing, you know, to use a basketball analogy, uh, iso ball or hero ball. And, you know, uh, your, your, your utilization was really high, but the team didn't win. Is that maybe a fair it's analogy? It's so true. And like the, the irony is as a, as a recovering rec league point guard, I will say like, that's not me. That's the, the irony of it. And every time I dig a hole for myself or every time I make my biggest, greatest mistakes, X, the ones that are kind of environmentally driven, it's because I am not out of the box. I am not palms up. I'm not kind of focusing on others in the world around me. And I, I, I once had a, a, a good friend, Ryan Drew, who's now at Under Armour, um, say to me, we were playing on a, on a basketball league and uh, we got into the huddle. I was like, okay, what do you want to do? He's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. He played at Cal. He's a really good player. And he said, uh, he said, whoa, 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 I'm the leading scorer. I'm not the captain. That's you. <laughs> and I thought that was really like an interesting insight in a basketball context. And so, so to come in and try to be the quote unquote leading scorer, that's not, that's not, that's not who I am. That's not in my DNA. And, um, and I think that's that, that hero ball analogy or the ISO ball analogy is, is a wonderful one and a, and a really one that really stings. So thanks for that. Oh, sorry. Well, I appreciate, I didn't mean for that to, to sting, but I thought there was an analogy. I appreciate you sharing, you know, the reflection around that story. I mean, going back to it, I mean, why, why, what do you think uh, if that promotion failed? I mean, it sounds like as you were teeing it up that those connections, teenage girls in sync radio, like what, what, when, when you say that failed, what was the measure of um, failure or what, what were sure. some of the causes of it failing? Yeah. So the measure was just ticket sales, ticket buyers, okay. yeah. you know, and it had a, had a, a de minimis impact. Um, and like I said, nothing was failing that they would ever touch. Why did it fail? I mean, we found out at four of the markets, the stuff never got out of the distribution center, which is kind of crazy. You know, that's just, again, about operation flow and relationships and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and generally, like, I, I think if I, you know, again, it was a long time ago. I think if I had to go back and do it again, I would have been more hands-on. You know, I actually would have been engaging like, one-on-one -on -one with the head of marketing, one-on-one -on -one with the head of broadcasting, one-on-one -on -one with operations and distribution. And, and I think we would have been more successful. Um, but, but, but the, the, again, you trip, you fall, you fail, you learn. I mean, that, that has to be the formula for life. I mean, that, that, that notion of intellectual curiosity um, is something I've learned from every great leader I've ever been around. They're all learning all the time. Well, you, you talked earlier about, um, you know, the idea of you have to be able to fail and, and, and in regards to innovation or startups, and that gets talked about a lot. Um, you know, if you look at the Sixers, they're in first place right now. They're number one in the East as we record this. They still, they lose one third of the time. 
Um, no, no team, even uh, the legendary Bulls with Michael Jordan. Nobody wins every game. The Warriors didn't win every game. Um, how do how do you sort of you know reconcile you know kind of the hyper competitive world of sports of always wanting to win with the recognition that sometimes you're going to lose? Like you you have an MBA from Harvard Business School. I'm sure people coming out of Harvard don't think their projects or businesses will fail one third of the time. How, how how have you sort of come to grips with with that? Yeah, I I never thought of it in those terms, but I think that's a really interesting perspective. I, well, I'd say first off, like I'm a I'm a terrible loser. Um, I I still don't get get really comfortable with that. In fact, my wife years ago, it, it said to me when I came home late one night, I was working with, with the Knicks and Rangers and Liberty. And she's like, literally is like, look, your teams are all rebuilding. How many games are you going to lose? Are you going to be miserable one out of every three nights of the year? Like this doesn't work. Like you, you need a new system, you know? And I thought it was a really insightful lesson from her. And, and for me at that point, you know, I had a choice to make, like I had to, you know, it's, it's hard You get, you, you actually are so invested in the team. Um, people often ask, like, are you like a fan? I was like, it's different from being a fan. You know, um, first of all, we're a little more transient. I mean, we move. I, you know, I've worked for the Nets and the, and the Eagles and the Knicks and the Rangers and the Devils and the Sixers. So I've worked for different teams and I, I love them, you know, when I'm there. Um, and but it's your livelihood. Like it, it's it's you are you are wrapped up in that. So in terms of winning and losing um, and how that kind of how that intersects with innovation. I think it's, uh, I guess a parallel track, you know, on the business side, it's relatively easy, right? I mean, we, we are going to innovate. If we're not moving forward, we're going backwards because the world is moving so fast. I mean, the world is changing all the time. I, I remember like being on a plane with David Stern, this goes back 10 years and he had a stack. This is, you know, kind of, he was an older school guy. But he had a stack, you know, seven inches high of newspaper clippings and magazine articles he wanted to read. And he, he's talking about and learning about life sciences and geopolitical landscapes and and um, and business and sports, you know. But he understood how interconnected the world is. And, and you look at at COVID right now, it's like most of my peers and I were spending more times with governors and mayors and Department of Health experts than we are with coaches or GMs or, or players. Because that's where we should spend our time, and so understanding that that the world is small and getting smaller, and and it's becoming more and more complex as technology emerges, it's like incumbent upon us to be to have our organization's kind of mindset be okay with pushing hard enough that we're going to fail and fall. And as leaders, we have to tell people if you're not failing enough, you're not pushing hard enough. You know, you are not pushing the envelope. And, and to do that, we'll, we'll get, you know, if you do the same thing over and over, the one thing you can promise is you get the same results. And we don't want the same results. You know, as I, or as I tell my kids, um, if you do what everybody else does, you get what everybody else gets. And, and in business, it's the same thing. It's like we have to be different and unique and try. And you have to be okay. And, and in this day and age, you make a mistake, and I've made many, you, they will slaughter you in the media. And slaughter you on social media. And I've been slaughtered in the media. And I've been slaughtered on social media. And that has to be okay. If you want to do something great. Yeah. But I mean, you, your mistakes are much more. Yeah. They're, it's interesting to think about you know how these are public mistakes. You are CEO of um, you know an organization. There are franchises that people care really deeply about. And um, that that level of emotion and dissatisfaction, it's one thing for somebody to have a bad meal in a restaurant and to maybe tweet something at the owner. But, you know, it's sports teams. That's that's a totally different connection. I'm, I'm sure that's that's why this work is so important to you. Yeah, it is. And I, I think sports holds a special place in the world. I really do. I, I have this like notion that it's a little more noble than just a game, you know, um, and, and I think um, the pandemic has screened that. Like we, you know, ha having the, the opportunity to be down in, in the bubble in Orlando um, was a pretty remarkable experience. But the one thing I noticed more than anything else is like, I was mentally healthier there. Like going to games, even before fans, and fans are finally back, thank goodness. But even before fans, walking into that arena and seeing the security guards and the ushers and the ticket takers and my colleagues from work, and getting to interact and then watch some of the greatest athletes in the world with the Sixers and the New Jersey Devils on the court and on the ice. And just, it just felt like 
okay. Everything is okay with the world. And I think we need that escapism and the, and the, the, and the rooting and the fanaticism and the scream and yell and dance, just like we need concerts back because we just need to feel that sense of community. And I think the power of sports and entertainment is what, because it brings us together. And so much of this last year has been separating us and dividing us as people, whether it be political lines or racial lines or, you know, state lines or city lines or, um, you know, any line you could possibly find. And, 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 and that's not what sports is about. Sports is about unity and, and, and love and, and coming together and rooting. And I don't know, I just, I just have a, a strong sense that, that we matter more now than ever. Mm-hmm. And when I think of passion and particularly with the devils, I'm reminded of, I should have gone back and watched it. I will. The Seinfeld episode where David Putty paints his face. <laughs> He's got the the that one. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah we, we've had him do a couple promos with us. It's a, he's, a, he's quite a character for sure. I, I bet. So, yeah, I mean, I think the Seinfeld friends thought that was a mistake on his part, too. Uh, they were appalled that he was a face painter, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Appalled he was a face painter and then appalled that he was living in New York City and, and rooting for uh, America's team, the New Jersey Devils. So, um, so good, good on him, I say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to ask one other sports question before asking about the book. And again, the title of that is Be Where Your Feet Are, Seven Principles to Keep You Present, Grounded and Thriving. The Philadelphia 76ers um, are famous in recent years for what was described as the process. And like with the work I do working with different organizations, we, we have process. There's process in healthcare that leads to people um, getting vaccinated or treated. And so I, I, it, my ears perked up when I, the first time I heard about the Sixers and quote unquote, the process. So I was wondering if you could kind of in a nutshell, explain what that process was and were there times when, when you or others involved with the team thought the process was a mistake? Sure. Uh, well, uh, the process, as it was coined by Tony Roten, who is one of our journeyman guards, um, he was asked, you know, he just said, hey, the coaches tell us, just trust the process. And that that became a moniker that I've heard a cat call to me f- from Shanghai to London to New York to South Philly. So kind of Sixers fans around the world kind of identify with now trust the process. And what it meant was that there were we weren't going to take any shortcuts to the top and that we were willing to take some short term term pain for long term gain. And you mentioned that at the top of the show that we were in first place. It wasn't always that way. You know, when I started at the Sixers in 2012, um, you know, we, we were, we were a cap team. So we're at the cap spending what you could spend. And, and yet, um, and we just made a, a, a trade that's at least widely known as one of the worst trades in NBA history for Andrew Bynum. And so the team was struggling. Uh, we didn't have any cap space. Uh, we had two first round picks over the next five years. And, we, and our business was uh, bottom five in every metric that I've ever seen in this sport. And so, and so that's where we were. And we decided to just have a long-term view. And uh, our general manager, Sam Hinkie at the time, used to say, if you want to go to the moon, you don't grab a ladder. And I used to think, okay, that's it. You know, that, that to me makes a lot of sense. And so, and so we made a lot of long-term decisions. Um, and, and that was about trading veterans, aging veterans, for draft picks and young prospects. And trying to build through the draft. And we did. And, you know, and now you have Joel Embiid, who's a, who will be the MVP of the NBA this year. And you have Ben Simmons, who is a monster, best defensive player in the year and all-star three years in a row. And so, so now you have two cornerstone horses who will guide this franchise for the next decade and have put, put us on the map and we're here to stay. And so, so the, but the, there are so many lessons um, in that process. And if you asked if we had problems, I don't know if we ever wanted to stop. But if, you, if, if we're, there were ever days where we looked ourselves in the mirror and said, what are we doing and why are we doing this? Yes, about every day. Um, this scrutiny was, was at a, it was a painful experience. And it felt at times, and I, and I think it feels like this when things go south in, in everybody's life now, it felt like the world was against us. And, um, and in, in, in many ways, a city like Philadelphia kind of digs that. Um, it's an underdog city. It's like, you know, Rocky Balboa, you know, um, Philly versus everybody, you know, you can hate us, but we love us, uh, kind of mentality. And I think that was a uh, really beneficial, you know, in terms of building the, the base we have now, you, I mean, you, you fast forward now and, you know, the value of our, 
of our organizations is up five times in the last seven years by all metrics. And then, you know, we have the largest season ticket base in the, in, in the, in the league. And it's a pretty, it's an incredible turnaround story um, that started with, with a moniker. And I, I, I would say that those types of hashtags, if you will, or, or monikers or catchphrases um, we had when I was with the Knicks, uh, it was Lynn Sanity. Cause I was there with Jeremy Lynn and, and the best, most laid plans are those driven by the fans. And that, that's one thing I learned that the team is there to amplify the fans work. Um, and so when, when Linsanity hit, we amplified it. When trust the process hit, we amplified it. We didn't adopt it, but we amplified it. It was kind of a, a pretty, pretty incredible process, but I'm glad I'm on the, uh, you know, to be on the other side on behalf of the fans. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm proud to have gone through it. Like I'm proud of the, of the, of the group that's still here that actually saw like, what does it take to win 10 games out of 82 and wake up every day and say like, let's get this done today. And that's what we did. It was a, it was a, it was a great um, piece on ESPN on sports center done with our, on our sales team. And, and amazingly through this, through this process, our, our sales kept, kept going up, which, which was mystifying everybody. And we just had, we had this Chris Hack, who's now the president and Jake Reynolds, who was at the time, I think director of VP of sales, they had created this environment and culture of fun and love. So it didn't matter if we won 10 games or 50, we were going to be 50 win ready. That's what we kept saying. Let's be 50 win ready. Like this organization will be from top to bottom operations, marketing, branding, ticket sales, sponsorship sales, communications. When this thing goes, we're going to be ready to pop. And that's what was our focus. And it was fun. It was a fun place to be with incredible people doing world beating work in the face of incredible headwinds. Yeah, um, cer- certainly glad. Though I don't want to do it again for whatever it's worth. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate you reminding me. It wasn't just the process, but trusting the process. I could see where you know uh, Embiid was injured and things happen, and it, threw, it may seem like well, it's throwing off the plan. I could see a lot of times there would be temptation to give up on that long term focus and say, okay, no, we 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 need a shortcut. Let's find the shortcut. And uh, I appreciate the the you know sticking with the plan because it's uh, it's paid off in recent years. Not to quote my friend Sam Hinkie, but he also used to say, uh, there are only shortcuts to the middle, which is a great line too, which I absolutely love. Say so you can take a shortcut if you want to get to the middle. Um, but but and that, that applies to life. That applies to relationships. That applies to parenting. That applies to just about everything you do in business. And one other business that comes to mind, you know, Toyota is a company I've learned a lot from and have admired, and they have 14 management principles that are described in a book called The Toyota Way. Number one is, I'm paraphrasing it, um, make decisions based on the long term, even at the expense of the short term. And, you know, that's, um, you know, a lot of companies find it challenging to emulate that long term focus. So it's interesting to me to hear a parallel with the Sixers. For sure. And that's, that's, it's hard to do. Um, and in, in this, in the, the difference between the sports business and other businesses is simply that, like, we have pressures. We're in a fishbowl, right? We have, um, yeah, we have everything from the media to our families to our neighbors to corporate partners to our season ticket holders, and they're kind of all around us, um, squeezing and leaning in and making life like harder. And, and so making those decisions and, and having that Toyota process and keeping that long-term approach, that's, that's the key. Yeah. So I want to ask you about the book, Scott, be where your feet are. Um, what, what led to the book? It's a big undertaking to do a book. Um, you know, why write it? Who, who's the audience do you think for this book? Sure. So, uh, so sad story why I wrote it uh, my best friend, unfortunately took his own life about a year and a half ago. And um, it's my best friend in the world. His name is Will Carden. Um, five kids, amazing family, uh, wonderful friends, very successful in business, and uh, I was suffering from depression. And I unfortunately spiraled into a, a, a bit of one myself after his uh, funeral. And, um, and this was my kind of purpose for healing. Um, so the book is, uh, is a mind, body, soul meets purposeful living. It's for anybody who is great, wants to be great, and want to lead others. Um, it is, um, it was a labor of love. It is not a victory lap around victory lane by any means. There are some, some stories from, from dear friends of mine, um, from, from people I, f- folks I work with to people I worked for, to just people I admire from Knight Shyamalan, a, a incredible director to, uh, 
Paul Rabel is the world's best lacrosse player to Marion Bartoli, who won uh, Wimbledon to David Stern, God rest his soul, the former commissioner of the NBA um, talking about the grind. And, you know, you have stories of them failing and struggling. And you're like, wait a second, Paul Rabel lost confidence on the lacrosse field. This dude is the best player ever. How is that possible? So the, the, the book goes through it, you know, um, some of their stories and struggles. And I provide some insight given um, kind of what I've done and who I've seen and what I've learned along the way. And we try to make it a, a practical journey to, to grow, um, you know, it's kind of learn, lead, love type model. And, um, and I, I think it's I think it's it's a really valuable book right now. Like we need to, we all need to heal. We all need to feel connection and we need to, to, to be back into our, our feeling that human connection that, that has been so missed. Well, thank you for uh, writing the book and, um, you know, I'm sorry, um, you know, to hear of uh, your loss and um, thank you for um, writing a book that I think will help inspire um, others. So I um, hope everybody will check that out. Um, Be Where Your Feet Are. Um, Scott O'Neill is the author. I hope everybody will check that out. So Scott, um, I can't thank you enough for you know sharing some of your stories. I always appreciate it when people are willing um, to, to talk about mistakes and what we've learned from them. And I um, really, really appreciate you doing that. Mark, thank you. And thanks for your, uh, your continued work and push in educating us. We need more of you out there. So thank you. Oh, gosh, I appreciate it. Thank you. And um, I'm, I'm going to root for your Sixers the rest of the year. You know, I, uh, Let's go. I, I, I've been transient. I have uh, became a San Antonio Spurs fan when we moved down there in uh, 2012. And that's an organization I admire a lot. But I'm going to pull for the Sixers now. Let's go. Love to have you at a game. If you're up east, let me know. You can sit oh, right I hope I can do that. I hope I can do that someday. That would be awesome. Me too. Thanks, Mark. I'm not going to paint my face, though. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Thank you.